Hello everyone, there was a game when I was a kid, back when monsters ruled the earth, the 1980s, and that game was called Top Trumps. Now in Top Trumps you have a pack of 30 cards on some sort of theme, which might have been cars, sports, dinosaurs, something like that. And you deal out all the cards to the players, and you pick a category. The person with the highest value in that chosen category wins the trick, wins the cards. Then the winner gets to pick the next category and the person with all the cards at the end wins the game. The caravan holidays would just fly by. Now what I want to know is, are all packs of top trumps the same? Is there a formula? Is there a winning strategy? And if there isn't, can I devise a mathematically perfect formula for a game of top trumps? This is my genuine investigation into this pack of top trumps, James Bond. So I was contacted by a freelance journalist called Frank Swain, who wanted to know if the game of top trumps was non-transitive. Non-transitive games are like rock, paper, scissors, where rock beats scissors, scissors beats paper, and paper beats rock in a big circle. There's no strong hand, there's no weak hand. What Frank wanted to know was, was top trumps non-transitive? So could we find a chain of cards where card one beat card two, card two beat card three, card three beat card four, and so on, until you reach card 30, and then card 30 would beat card one in a big circle. Now we contacted the company that makes Top Trumps and they assured us that there was a formula but they wouldn't tell us what it was. So we had to analyse the game for ourselves. Now in the 80s the greatest secret agent in the world was Danger Mouse obviously but James Bond was a close second so this pack seems appropriate. So for example here's Roger Moore. It's like watching your granddad play James Bond. Now, obviously, James Bond himself wouldn't be seen dead playing a game like Top Trumps. He was more sort of a back arm man. It's difficult to be suave when you're comparing the relative heights of dinosaurs. But no matter, we've got six categories here, and those categories are first assignment, style and charm, seduction, brutality, twisted mind, and threat to the world. So, for Roger Moore, First assignment, 1973. Brutality, 43 points. Style and charm, 007 points. Uh, uh, but keep in mind that six of those points were just for his right eyebrow. Or, here are two villainous characters, Blofeld and Oddjob, try not to mix up those two names. Now, let's say a player picks the category Seduction, then Blofeld scores one point, but Oddjob scores three. The ladies love a bowler hat. First I thought, let's assume that each category is equally likely to be chosen. So there are six categories, so let's say each category is picked one sixth of the time. And let's list the cards from the strongest card to the weakest card, with player one going down the side and player two going across the top. Then if we colour in the boxes red, where player one beats player two with a greater than 50% probability, I expected to find something like this. Now you can see here, if you look at the edge of the red triangle, card one beats card two, card two beats card three, card three beats card four, and so on, until you get to card 30. If you want card 30 to beat card one, I'm going to change it a little bit so it looks like this. Uh, but this is what I expected to find. What I actually found was this. And it's the same sort of general shape but there's a lot less red, and you can now see that the game is not non-transitive. Look at the bottom line, look at card number 30. It's a very weak card. It doesn't beat any other card with a greater than 50% probability. And who is that poor sap? Felix Leiter. Suck it, USA! So who else is in the bottom 10? Well, Miss Moneypenny is there with a probability of winning of only 39%. And surprisingly, Daniel Craig with a probability of winning of 40%. And who's above Daniel Craig? George Lazenby, the much maligned George Lazenby. On Her Majesty's Secret Service, it's a great film. Uh, John Barry, Louis Armstrong, Diana Rigg, Teddy Savalas, and a castle full of beautiful, exotic women from all over the world. 
and Morecambe. That's true, you can look it up. Okay, now, who's in the top 10? Well, Sean Connery's there with a probability of winning of 52%. Uh, Max Zorin. And who's winning? Who's number one? Well, the appropriately named Xenia Onatop, the Russian spy who can kill a man by crossing him between her mighty thighs. I hear Vladimir Putin can do much the same. Now let's try and be a little bit more sophisticated about this. Let's assume that each player has a perfect knowledge of the game. Trust me, if you've been on a caravan holiday, that won't take you very long. So, let's assume that each player is able to pick their strongest category. Now, there's a problem here because all the categories have a different scale. Some are out of 100, some are out of 10,000. So the first thing I had to do was rescale everything out of 30. Now, I assumed that the category with the highest value would be the strongest category, but I was wrong. And it was actually Frank who pointed this out to me. Let's say you have a category with a score of 30. But if all the other cards have an equal score of 30, that isn't going to be a very strong category. Your strongest category is not necessarily the one with the highest value. In fact, your strongest category is going to be the category that beats the most other cards. Putting that into our matrix, if you pick your strongest category, it now looks like this. And suddenly you become much more likely to win. There's a lot more red there. On the other hand, if your opponent picks their strongest category, the matrix looks like this. You become a lot less likely to win. If you take the average between those two situations, the scores change. Felix Leiter is no longer the bottom card. Knickknack is, diminutive in score as well as stature. In the top 10, nothing can shake our Russian femme fatale, but Miss Moneypenny rises to the top 10 to be sandwiched between Daniel Craig and Sean Connery, just like in her dreams. Now I told you, when I first did this, I made a mistake. I rescaled all the categories out of 30, and I took the category with the highest score to be the strongest category, which was a mistake. But if you do that, look what happens. All the James Bonds rise to the top, which makes me think, maybe this is the formula that they were using to make the pack. And if it is, I'm not sure it's the right formula to use. But the game wasn't non-transitive, so I wondered, could I devise a mathematically perfect version of top trumps, where each category would be equally strong, which is not true in the Bond game, and where there exists a chain of cards where each card beats the next card in a big circle. And so I did it. And so here is my mathematically perfect version of Top Trump's Mathematicians. Yeah, has he had them printed? Yes, he bloody has. 30 of the greatest mathematicians competing in categories such as style, coffee rating, and sociability. Sociability only needed very small numbers. Uh, so for example, Isaac Newton has a greatness of 10,000. Uh, Euclid had a chalk coefficient of 1.97 and Gauss had a dynamic invariable of 5050. Not available in the shops and for good reason. Now I'm not going to tell you my formula either or who comes out on top but if each category was equally likely to be chosen the matrix now looks like this. And you can see the structure. You can also see that the game is non-transitive. There's a diagonal line there of red squares that shows that card one beats card two, card two beats card three, and so on, until you get card 30 beats card one again. Now, if you pick your strongest category, the matrix is gonna look like this. But if your opponent picks their strongest category, the matrix now looks like this. It's the exact opposite. Now, I'm not saying that this is a better version of Top Trumps. This is just my mathematically perfect version of Top Trumps. And so, there you have it.